Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. We're continuing our discussion of 1920 to 45, and in this series of lectures talking about the triumph of nativism, the triumph in the early 1920s of an atmosphere of fear of immigrants and a celebration of those who were already living in the country. In the previous lecture, we talked about some of the early conditions leading up to the Red Scare. And in this lecture, we're going to focus on the Red Scare itself. In the previous lecture, we talked a little bit about the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 and the reasons why a fear of communism led to a fear of workers in the United States and all around the world. Communism was associated with workers who both were largely immigrant in nature and also were likely to be drawn to the ideas of communist ideology, which involved uh, kind of sharing the wealth amongst everyone. Uh, and so there definitely was a fear and suspicion of labor in the late 19-teens and early 1920s. And then if you combine that with the fact that hundreds of thousands, even millions of soldiers were returning from World War I, and as I described in the previous lecture, often returning to find that jobs were scarce or that their jobs had been taken perhaps by uh, African Americans moving up from the South or by immigrants, and it just led to an atmosphere of turmoil on the labor front in 1919 and into 1920. There was a lot of labor strife and many strikes, uh, particularly in the year 1919. And again, this is a result of the labor market contracting. Many of the gains that they had made prior to World War I and during the war were now being erased. So I should note that workers in the early 1920s had plenty to protest about, and not all strikes were necessarily associated with communist ideology. Um, workers in the 1920s worked long hours and could be fired really at any time and with little cause. There was great risk of injury in many different kinds of work and still little to no workman's compensation if a worker did suffer an injury in the workplace. There was very little regulation of industry, no insurance, and no company fear of a lawsuit for injuries or death on the job in the way that there certainly would be today. So those of you who might have taken the Gilded Age course would remember there was some movement in this direction during the Progressive Era, but still not much uh, in the way of regulation of big business. There was also still a large percentage of the population working jobs associated with the natural world farmers, lumberjacks, fishermen, ranchers, and so on. These kind of occupations all suffered the vagaries of nature and weather, rain, drought, forest fires, cold, storms, and so on. There was also a lot of day labor and seasonal labor, especially for the immigrant population. So you would head down to the factory or the mill or the docks uh, in the morning, and the foreman would hand out assignments to whoever he selected on that particular day. Other jobs were seasonal, and many workers migrated. Agricultural jobs, for instance, picking fruit, uh, even lumber and coal had its peak seasons of the year. So wages were subject to the vagaries of supply and demand, and often shifted with the seasons. For all of these reasons and others, even in the best of times in the 1920s, about 10% of the workforce was consistently unemployed, with no unemployment insurance or federal welfare. Workers tried to organize to secure a safer and less demanding work environment, but after the war, businesses tried to scale back the wartime gains that labor had made, and again, in the compressed job market in the aftermath of the war, Really, all the cards were in the hands of big business, and labor didn't have a whole lot to fall back on. So again, this leads to an atmosphere of tremendous labor strife. The strikes began almost immediately upon the armistice in late 1918. The amalgamated clothing workers struck on November 22, 1918, for higher wages and a 44-hour work week, and they actually prevailed in that strike. In January 1919, 
35,000 shipyard workers went out on strike in Seattle. It was a general strike of massive proportions, and many saw in it the beginnings of European and Russian radicalism. The mayor of Seattle, named Ole Hansen, called it a Soviet threat. He called in federal troops, and the strike was crushed. The fear of communism was rampant at this time. Many agreed with the sentiments of General Leonard Wood, who wanted to deport communists in, quote, ships of stone with sails of lead, with the wrath of God for a breeze, and with hell for their first port. So these people are not messing around. This is virulent language against communists during this time. And Leonard Wood, by the way, rode this wave of anti-communist sentiment to the beginnings of a run for the presidency. The tendency in such instances was to blame outside agitators. In March of 1919, the Bolsheviks established the Third International, calling for a worldwide revolution and thus the spread of communism around the world. In the so-called May Day plot, by early May of 1919, there were over 20 bombs discovered in the mail, addressed to prominent capitalist figures like John D. Rockefeller and Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. A number of the bombs were successfully detonated, and the Red Scare was officially underway. In June of 1919, the Attorney General of the United States, A. Mitchell Palmer, had his house blown up. The bomber tripped on the doorstep, blowing himself up in the process, and Palmer escaped unharmed. Palmer and the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, began investigating radicals, rooting them out. Ultimately, there were many who were arrested and deported. Palmer, Hoover, and others assembled lists of names and collected data on suspected radicals. Palmer took the lead in the crackdown on radicals. He was eyeing a nomination for the presidency in 1920 and particularly targeted immigrants. At one point, he said, out of the sly and crafty eyes of many of them leap cupidity, cruelty, insanity, and crime. From their lopsided faces, sloping brows, and misshapen features may be recognized the unmistakable criminal types. Among the most common victims were members of the International Workers of the World, the IWW, who were often called the Wobblies. Think about that name for a moment, the International Workers of the World. Many were immigrants. They were typically left-leaning, including socialists, anarchists, and syndicalists who believed in achieving their goals through unionization. They were led by a man named Big Bill Haywood. The IWW had opposed World War I, which was a dangerous position in the country, and many had been arrested under the Alien and Sedition Act. Over a thousand more Wobblies were arrested during this period of the Red Scare, and several were killed by mobs, virtually never resulting in the arrest of their killers. On January 1, 1920, Palmer called for a roundup of the radicals. On January 2nd, agents around the country arrested more than 4,000 people and 2,000 more in the following weeks. Various congressional committees were established to investigate radicals. And in New York State, the Lusk Committee rooted out radicals. Archibald Stevenson, a New York lawyer on the Lusk Committee, testified about dangerous radicals and at one point held up a list of 62 dangerous people. The names included Jane Addams and Lillian Wald of the Settlement House movement. If you look at this document here, this is a list as part of the Lusk Committee. And it says the following is a list of Lithuanian Bolshevists and so on. This is in Binghamton, New York. And whoever submitted this list just picked out all of these names, provided the addresses, and the results could be catastrophic for anyone named on a list like this. So think about how dangerous this was. Anyone could just merely suggest that you were a Bolshevist or you were a communist and you could lose your job or perhaps even be arrested or deported during this time.
In the fall of 1919, there were several more major strikes. In September, in Boston, the police force went on strike, which created the double threat of a radical group walking out on strike, but also leaving the streets unprotected. More than 1,100 police went out on strike. It was a two-day strike at the end of which they were fired, a move supported by Calvin Coolidge, who was then the governor of Massachusetts. And Coolidge really made a name for himself during this episode. He was hailed as a hero, saying uh, essentially there, that the police had no right to strike against public safety by anyone, anywhere, anytime. And that became a famous slogan as Coolidge then campaigned for the presidency. Over the course of the summer, steel workers, mine workers, and others went out on strike. The nation grew petrified of this radical infestation. Most Americans and the media applauded the raids. More than 600 immigrants were deported. There was much fear and suspicion of immigrants, as I've noted, but also they had their hatred validated by the Attorney General, which gave credibility to the whole enterprise. The government of the United States supported this attitude of fear and hatred against immigrants. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about other vestiges of this kind of fear and hatred in the form of the Ku Klux Klan and the film Birth of a Nation.